Well, welcome, welcome back from lunch. Um, thank you, Prescott, for having us. My plane left, um, where did I come from this morning? Denver. They called me at 1 o'clock in the morning and said that it was delayed, which was really not necessary. So um, I'm going to give a, probably a little different sort of talk. How do I get my first slide? What do I do? What? No, that's the second slide. Aha, good. Um, is this live? Which is the live? Is this the live one? Yeah, OK. And the lights are killing me, actually. Um, so I, I know a lot of you in here probably do dog training or are interested in dogs. So I'm going to give it like a, a more generic lecture or talk um, about animal emotions, um, uh -oh, what I call beastly passions, and sort of big picture views about how we can apply what we know not only to training individual dogs with different sorts of quote, problems, it's usually people problems, um, and big questions in um, a new field called compassionate conservation. And the phrases that I like to use are redecorating nature because we redecorate nature sort of um, willy-nilly. It's like, oh, wouldn't wolves look good in Yellowstone Park? Wouldn't animals look good somewhere? Wouldn't a couch look good in the living room? And really, a lot of these moves that I support are done, though, looking at animals as non-sentient, non-feeling beings. Um, I like to talk about a compassion footprint to sort of um, counter the notion of the carbon footprint. And I'll talk to you about rewilding our hearts. Because I think that we're naturally born in a wild state, and that education and culture and just a whole lot of other things unwild us. So I'm not going to go through all these questions here, but some of my major questions is what do animals feel about what's happening to them? What is it like to be a dog? What does it feel like to be a dog? And what's their point of view? Because animals have a point of view on what's happening to them. And I'll talk, I'll talk directly to, but also around the notion of what animals want and what animals need. Some people say, well, you don't really know what animals want and what they need. And while we may not know the details for specific individuals, non-human animals like human animals want to live in peace and live in safety, absent pain and suffering. I mean, to me, that's a no-brainer. But there might be details among individuals of a species or between species that we can sort out. Why do we do invasive things in the name of science and food and clothing and entertainment? I, I know you can read this. But one of the big things that I'm really interested in is why good welfare is not good enough. And the reason I say that is <coughs> because existing laws and regulations about animal protection allow you to do the most horrific things to animals. So for example, in the United States, the Animal Welfare Act basically does not refer to rodents and fish, birds, invertebrates as animals. And there's actually a sentence in there that says, we are, <coughs> we are defining animals to exclude rats of the genus ratus and mice of the genus mus. So I mean, the last time I looked, rats and mice and birds and invertebrates are animals. They're definitely not plants. And so, the real big thing is that people say, a lot of my colleagues in research say, well, we're doing what's allowed. Well, you know, you can centrifuge animals, you can chop them up, and you can do really horrific things to them. And you can actually do horrific things to dogs and other animals. So in my eyes, good welfare is not good enough. And one thing I'm interested also is how we can we enrich the lives of animals. Um, because I do talk to dog trainers, and I'm not a dog trainer at all. But I like to think of dog training as really dog teaching. I don't like the word training, because the word training implies some kind of manipulative control. It's like breaking animals for circuses. You know, when you, they, they still use that term, breaking elephants. And really, what you're doing is you're breaking their hearts. You know, you're making them submissive and fearful, so they'll do anything you want them to do. But the fact is. It's really teaching, not training, in my 
um, view. How do you do this? You, okay. So I was at a meeting. I know Clive was at this meeting at UCLA called um, How Like Us Are They? And I love this quote. There's a great book by James Coetzee called The Lives of Animals. And one of the characters in there, Elizabeth Costello, says, anyone who says that life matters less to animals than it does to us has not held in his hands an animal fighting for its life. The whole of the being of the animal is thrown into that fight without reserve. Okay, so these are just some general take home notes to, um, that non human animals have preferences and want to avoid pain and suffering. They have desires and beliefs. Um, they're not less than us or lower than us. That hierarchical speciesism doesn't work. And one of the things that I've discovered over years of doing research is that this normative thinking about the dog, the wolf, the cat, the cow, the coyote is really misleading. Because one of the really fascinating things about doing research in animal behavior is looking at individual variability within species. So in my field work, when baby coyotes come out of the den at three weeks of age, they're really different. There's bold animals, there's shy animals, there's assertive animals. So you really see these differences. And really, the challenge is to try to figure out, because I'm an evolutionary biologist too, is how these differences in development cash out during the life of individuals. And for example, does it influence individual reproductive success? The answer is it does. And like I said, before, what other animals want, need, know, and feel matters to them as it should to us. And so I'm going to show you what, one of the things that always gets me is how free some people feel to write popular books. They actually sell pretty well about animals when they've never really lived with or studied animals. Everybody wants to write a dog book. And there's books on the market that have sold millions of copies that are just loaded with errors. So I think it's really important to have contact with animals. I'm going to skip through a few slides, but I brought this one because Adam's there. <laughs> <laughs> I do remember visiting Adam in Budapest, and there was this um, European gray wolf. And I, Adam may not remember it. And I said, is it OK to go in with him? And Adam said, I think so. <laughs> and so that was a big thinking. Um, and stuff, but um, yeah, I mean, it took a little while. I just sat there and talked to Adam and his assistant, and finally, Wolf came over and took my ear in his mouth. It was actually quite a lovely welcome to Budapest. Um, and then I also met this grizzly there. It's a coyote outside of Denver whose parents and um, siblings were all shot because they supposedly had chased a little child put a lot of emphasis on the word supposedly. And once again, if you know, if I know a lot of you in here know canid behavior, but it took a long time for me to just sit by this coyote until he came over and kind of leaned into me. But you can tell by his facial expression and his posture, he's just not sure about this big white human being who wants to be his friend. But it's important to meet animals, because this is Bessie, a rescued dairy cow at um, Farm Sanctuary in California. And one of my favorites is Geraldine a pig. Geraldine had been tortured in research and was rescued by a group called um, Kindness Ranch. It's a lovely ranch north of Cheyenne, Wyoming, where they specialize in rescuing animals from laboratory situations. And she was like a little puppy. She would roll over on her back and show me her stomach. And it really it, it pained me to think that she would be called bacon, sausage, or ham at some point, as are billions of pigs. This is a chimpanzee named Yuri who was raised by a rich person in Texas. And the reason I show you this is because people used to debate, well, do non human you know, some people would say, do non-human animals have emotions? I mean, and that's just a non, a, you know, a no-brainer. But you know, do non-human animals suffer from human, quote, human-like disorders. And we know very clearly now that many animals suffer from stress, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder. And Yuri had this thing. Oh, Yuri had, I don't even know how to do this. I'm terrible on this. OK. Um, where he would have to have a blanket over his head. 
And after four hours, I, I sat there for about four hours and I talked to him. I even read part of one of my books and I could tell I was just boring the hell out of him. <laughs> it was like, what are you doing here? He finally, I started getting up to leave and the woman, Lee, who ran the sanctuary in Texas said, you know, she kept saying, turn around. And, Yuri made contact with my finger, and it was, a really, it was a really great feeling because it drove home the point that animals do suffer from severe psychological disorders. I mean, once again, the basis of dog training is that a lot of them are highly fearful or highly aggressive because of the way that they've been handled and mistreated by human beings. Um, and then the next day when I went to see him, he, he was my friend, but he told me not to read. Um, <laughs> at least not read anything I wrote. <laughs> um, and this is a dingo on Fraser Island in <coughs> Australia. It's off um, Harvey Bay, off the east coast of Australia. And you can see I positioned myself behind these five women um, because they were all going, oh, cute dingo. But Dingoes had been biting people, and right before I was there, had attacked a little boy and done a, um, a really bad job on his face. And this slide really just brought home a lot of problems. We have, I call them quote problems, in the states and elsewhere with urban um, wildlife. Like, I live in Boulder, Colorado, and we have quote problems with urban coyotes. People feed them, they think that they're all really cute little dogs. And the women kept saying, well, what do you think about, you know, the, this animal? And I said, well, you, you know, you, what I think is you can tell where I'm standing. <laughs> because we invaded, it was, it was a female, her habitat. And of course they were upset with us because we had come into their living rooms and taken over their space. Um, this is a cormorant I met. I tried reading to him, but he was absolutely nonplussed. Um, the next slide is a really interesting one. <coughs> this is a dog named Parsifal. I met Parsifal about five weeks ago in Turin, Italy. And what was fascinating about him, when I first met him, I had no idea about his background. But then I discovered that he was part of a feral pack of dogs living in southern Italy. And they were about as feral as dogs could be. You know, they were eating garbage, but they had no human contact at all. And this, if he had looked more like a husky or a wolf, I would have believed in the sense that he might have been a wolf. I mean, that's how his behavior was so distinctly different from dogs who had been raised normally, socialized to humans and to um, other dogs. And it was a real lesson for me because I, I had a graduate student years ago who studied feral dogs in um, New Mexico, Arizona, and in um, Texas. And I met some of these dogs, but I'd forgotten what they were like. To see a dog who is fearful, smart. I mean, I like to say that these feral dogs are street smart. They could get along really well where many dogs couldn't. And then I talked to the woman who had taken him under his, her wing, and she was just telling me how, how much work it really took to get him to trust her and to listen to her and not to fear her and stuff. So it was, I, I wish I could have learned more about him, but it was just his mannerisms that really got me thinking about how dogs are so tied into who who they are because of their long-term relationship with us, but how that could be overridden very fast by not socializing them in a, uh, an appropriate way. And, and these are just some cougars around my house. Um, one of the things that I really work on a lot in conservation is urban wildlife because animals are invading, if you will. No, I'm going to say that again. We've invaded their living rooms, and they're pissed off about it and they don't like it. And these are cougars just living around my house. And I've been as close to cougars three times as I am to this, whatever this is, this speaker, and I'm obviously here. And people go, oh, that's really cool. No, there was nothing cool about it. I mean, I didn't like it at all. I never, ever want to be near a cougar again. But this is just an example of how we are invading their wildlife. These are cougars at a shopping center in Denver. I think they were having a sale on shoes or something. Um, I don't know, but the cougars tended to hang out there. 
and bears as well hang out. And I kind of use this, these ideas when people tell me they're mad about wildlife or mad about animals, the double meaning of the word mad. They're mad about them because they supposedly love them, but they're mad about them because, at least where I live, people move into the mountains to be near the animals until the animals actually behave as the animals who they are, and then they decide that they really don't like them. And so about a month ago, a bear who had just been at my house the week before was shot to death in Boulder because he supposedly had broken into the kitchen of a house. Well, of, of, of course he did. I mean, they left the window open at night, and he probably smelled all the human food, and he decided, well, why not go for it, okay? So it turned out that it was a cub who had broken into his house, not the adult bear. So some general points I want to make before I move on and, um, would be that humans are a very conceited lot. We're overpopulated, we're overconsuming, we're big-brained, we're big-footed, we're arrogant, and we're invasive. And we do a lot of really good things, of course. But when people start talking about how we protect invasive species, I always think about who the most invasive species really is that animals depend on our goodwill and best intentions, and that we're really powerful. I mean, as human beings, we're very powerful mammals on this planet, but that power shouldn't be giving us license to do whatever we want to other animals. That caring about animals isn't radical or extreme, and we don't have to apologize for caring and feeling for animals. And when I was in Australia a couple months ago, this guy just said something that it actually almost kept me up all night, that we don't have to apologize for having a sense of wonder about who these other animals are. And we don't have to feel badly about, um, we don't have to feel badly for feeling. Because I've had students who will say, oh, you know, so-and-so said I have to dissect animals. So-and-so said, said I have to do invasive experiments because that's the only way I'm going to be educated in, say, the biological or the psychological sciences. And I just think that's rubbish. We don't have to do anything that harms animals to learn about animals. We can, we, there's plenty of good research done that's non-invasive that can actually enrich the lives of the animals. And from that research, we can learn about who, not what, these animals are. So a couple of just little one-liners um, about our confused relationships with other animals. When people tell me they love animals and then they harm them, I say, I'm glad they don't love me. I mean, I know people who say, well, I go deer hunting because I love deer. And they're talking to me about how they love deer while they have a deer carcass on the top of their car. And I'm saying, please don't fall in love with me. Um, when people say they're not sure if dogs are emotional beings, I always say, I'm glad I'm not their dog. And the questions that I like to ask, because I think in order to make um, advances in the study of animal cognition, animal emotions, animal moral behavior, is to step out of our comfort zones. This, it, we live in a really terribly challenging world, especially with respect to our relationships with other animals. So I always like to say, would you do it to your dog? So I say to somebody who chops up mice in a lab, or does horrifically invasive research on other animals, would you do it to your dog? And you know what the, quest, the, the answer invariably is? Come on. Thank you. Okay. Just want to make sure you're awake. Well, no, they'll say, well, no, I won't. And I'll say, well, why is the dog in your lab or the cat in your lab different from the dog who lives with you at home? And then they'll go, well, you know. And that always gets me. <laughs> um, but I think we need to ask that question. Would you trade places with a cow or a pig on a factory farm? When you t say to people, well, would you put your dog on a factory farm? Oh, no, I would never do that. So I'm not trying to be pissy about it, to be quite frank with you, but I really think that we need to ask really difficult questions about our relationship with other animals. That's what the field of anthrozoology is really focusing on now, and step out of our comfort zones. We're too comfortable as human beings. We have a lot of power. We interpret that power to mean license for doing anything that we want. And I just, just this week, 
the University of Colorado in Boulder, where I taught for years, but I'm still active there, is thinking about reinstating vivisection into their psychology labs. I mean, you talk about a step backwards. They actually stopped it or reduced the number of animals who they were using, and now they want to reinstate them. While other schools, medical schools, veterinary schools, colleges, universities, across the board are phasing out the use of live animals and doing horrific um, vivisection. Now, one of the things I'm really interested too as an evolutionary biologist, comparative biologist, deals with the notion of speciesism. And speciesism is really the practice of assigning characteristics to species as a whole, but not to individuals. It's that normative thinking, all and only humans do something, all and only chimpanzees do something. But we run into something really, a very a big problem really fast. So for example, when a, whoop, when a mouse or a bird outperforms a chimpanzee, People really say the mice or bird is smarter than the chimpanzee, but when the opposite is true, you'll read articles in the New York Times telling you how smart chimpanzees are compared to other animals, ignoring the fact that animals such as New Caledonian crows make and use much more sophisticated tools than do chimpanzees. So we really need to go beyond speciesism because it translates into the use of words like higher and lower, and higher translates into better or more valuable, Lower means less valuable, not as smart. And what that translates into in terms of practice is horrific animal abuse. abuse. So I always just like to say that individuals do what they need to do to be card-carrying members of their species. And the next slide shows you all about what speciesism um, can get you into. You can read it, I'm sure. Well, if you can, I'll read it for you. You can all read it, right? Yeah. Okay, good. I mean, but, but this is, I mean, it makes the case really clear that, you know, animals do what they need to do to be card-carrying members of their species, and so they do odd things. Dogs put their noses in places where I wouldn't ever imagine putting my nose. They can hear things I can't hear, and I can fret over taxes and worry about whether my computer's gonna turn on in the morning, and they don't. But none of those are really high, more highly evolved or meaningful skills. They're more meaningful to an individual who is a member of a particular species. So <coughs> in the work I do, I follow a scheme that was put forth by a man named Nico Tinbergen. In 1973, the most amazing thing happened. Three men won the Nobel Prize in the area of physiology or medicine. There was no area for animal behavior. Conrad Lorenz, Nico Tinbergen, and Carl von Frisch. You may know Carl von Frisch's name. He's the man who discovered bee language, how bees basically do the round dance and the whale dance and tell other bees where food is. Lorenz, of course, just generated very important models of behavior. And Tinbergen was really a consummate field biologist, and Tinbergen stressed that there are four areas that we want to consider when we study animal behavior. We want to ask questions about evolution, adaptation, causation, ontogeny, or development. And Gordon Berghardt, who's a psychologist at the University of Tennessee, who does a lot of research on play behavior, added the fifth category to a Tinbergen scheme called private experience, or subjective experience. So, for example, in the work I do on play, and I'll talk about this tomorrow, I want to know why did play evolve? What were the selective forces that resulted in play appearing in the behavioral repertoire of certain species and maybe appearing in different forms across species? How does it allow an individual to adapt to his or her environment? Usually cashed out in terms of reproductive success, reproductive fitness, what causes a behavior, and Tinbergen was really very famous for putting forth the importance of external and internal stimuli. I mean, he wrote a book called The Study of Instinct that was published in 1951, and you know, a lot of his ideas seemed so archaic 
And they, you, but, but the fact of the matter is, back in the 1950s, the study of animal behavior was primitive compared to most other sciences. And then, of course, what Gordon was, Berghut was suggesting was private experience. So you could ask the same questions. Why would subjective experiences or feelings evolve? How did they allow individuals to adapt to their particular environment, perhaps social environments? What causes them? And how do they develop? Now, one principle that I rely on, and I think is the foundation for a lot of work in um, the study of animal behavior, the study of animal emotions, is Charles Darwin's notion of evolutionary continuity. And I love this is just, once again, a dog who's just kind of gone through some of this stuff and gone, oh, please. I mean, let's, <laughs> let's not bore ourselves with it. But Darwin's idea, I think, is really one of the foundational ideas in the sense that he argued that differences among species are differences in degree rather than differences in kind, which translates into uh, the differences among species are shades of gray, not black and white. And I like to think the bumper sticker for continuity is if we have something, they, other animals, have it too. So we have brains, they have brains, we have hearts, they have hearts, we have stomachs, they have stomachs. And it's defined functionally because hearts differ. There can be two or three or four chambered hearts, but if they function, if an organ functions to pump blood, we call it a heart, okay? Brains differ in terms of structure across species, but they have certain underlying homologies. And so this is really important because it's bad biology to rob other animals of their emotions, if you will, of their sentience, okay? Solid biology, there's no way we are the only animals in the animal kingdom who have rich and deep emotional lives. There's no way that we are the only, quote, moral beings. And there's good biology that supports it. And of course, the wealth of data that are being collected and published almost daily now in the general field of cognitive ethology really um, supports that claim. And I wrote a paper last year. Um, last July, some of you may know, uh, 16 scientists at Cambridge University in the UK put forth the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness. It was a, yes, it was really great. Of course, we knew this all the time, but these were very famous biologists, only two of whom ever really watched a whole animal. The others cut up animals or didn't even study animals. They got Stephen Hawking there. So amidst the champagne and the TV, these 16 scientists came up with the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness. It's long overdue, and as soon as I got done writing about it and being facetious about it, yeah, it was important. So people were happy that these very famous scientists put it forth. But anybody who's ever been around animals who, or who studied animals knew this. And I wrote an article for New Scientists, and they called it Welcome to Our World. And what I loved about it was the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness talked about vertebrates, particularly mammals. Some birds, mammals, maybe octopus, and left fish out. But now there's wonderful work doing, done by Victoria Braithwaite on sentience in fish. And so last week, I came up with the idea of having a declaration on animal sentience. That, that Animals are sentient beings, and we should stop pretending that they're not, because the pretense is what allows us to harm them, and the pretense is what allows us to keep that division. Humans above, it's a species, speciesistic view, and other animals. And I think it's very important when we write, and I always make my students write about humans and other animals, because we are animals. We're not plants, as far as I know. I mean, some people are, I think, but, um, <laughs> but, but we're, we're generally not. And with respect to continuity, we, all mammals share the same neuroanatomical structures in the limbic system that are important for feelings. So, I mean, the, the data are there. If we want to hide behind whatever we do and we want to pretend they're not, that's fine. But I think that 
Not only is it harmful to other animals, but it's incredibly bad biology. Now, another thing, I know a lot of you know this, but maybe I'm giving you some food of thought when you talk to other people, um, that animals live in very different sensory worlds. And so if I were a dog, this would be my dream. I mean, I couldn't imagine wanting to do anything else but peeing on everything and then sniffing. But this is really important. And the minute I say that this is all very obvious to everybody, I think of zoos where they put prey animals next to predators. They're all in cages, of course, so they're not going to get attacked. And they wonder why the prey animals are stressed out 24-7. Well, it's because they tend to avoid predators. They don't tend to live near them. Okay, So there's, once again, very practical aspects, I think, of realizing that other animals live in very different sensory and motor worlds. There's a wonderful new research on infrasound in elephants, where they're communicating over 20 kilometers through the substrate, through the ground. And you know, in Boulder, Colorado, people go, well, yeah, it's just you know, voodoo and it's all the fluff. But the fact of the matter is there really are good reasons for how animals can communicate over long distances. It's just going to take a lot of research to discover their phenomenal capabilities. And animals also are very discriminating. And um, so <laughs> you, 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 can't, you can't talk about animals, you know, just, oh, well, you know, they treat all stimuli in the same way. Because once again, as far as I'm concerned, that when I started doing research in this field years ago, it was focusing on individual differences that was really, really important. Um, individual differences in baby coyotes and wolves, for example, at the age when you wouldn't expect these differences to emerge. They come out of a hole in the ground, same mother, same hole, and they are radically different. Okay. Now, another hooker is anthropomorphism. And I, as far as I'm concerned, we should never even talk about this again. And I'll tell you why. So I'm kind of violating my dictum. But it's really double talk among the people I know. So for example, I was at a meeting um, with zoo people. And I said that an elephant in captivity wasn't happy. And one of the guys in the audience said, oh, but she's doing fine. She's happy. You know, you're just being, you know, you know just being anthropomorphic. And then it got really quiet. And I was thinking, well, Obviously, what happened was, why could he say an animal was happy without being anthropomorphic? But if I say an animal is in pain and suffering, I'm being anthropomorphic. Well, historically, there's been this resistance of applying positive emotions to non-human animals. I mean, you can go back in the literature, and you can see talking about angry animals, mad animals. But when people started talking about happy animals, or animals feeling pleasure and joy, people started getting a little upset. And so if you believe in continuity, I don't see how one cannot believe in continuity. The bottom line is that we're not inserting something human into animals that they don't have. We're just not doing it, OK? So the real question is, why have various emotions evolved, not if they've evolved? Why would you expect to see moral sensibility in non-human animals, not do they have this moral sensibility, OK? I mean, I, I think the f there's fewer and fewer skeptics. One, I call Marion Dawkins at Oxford University the skeptic du jour, because Marion Dawkins has done a lot of really nice work in the field of animal welfare. But she wrote a book last year called Why Animals Matter. And she basically said, we still don't know if animals are conscious. She said we should be, this is a quote, militantly agnostic about claiming that other animals are conscious. So I call that Dawkins' dangerous idea. And it's kind of a play off of her ex-husband, Richard Dawkins. But, um, but it's a very dangerous idea to say that we don't know if other animals are conscious. How could they not be conscious? I mean, I, I, I suppose philosophers can beat this thing to death while animals are dying and being abused. But I don't see how we could ever make that argument. Now, another thing that people say is, well, you can't really study animal emotions. You know, you can't really use you know, what they might call objective criteria. 
Well, I think you can, so look at animal love. Do, do non-human animals love one another? Well, of course they do. If we love other animals, if we have love, they do. So how might you study this? Well, in my work, but I mean other people have done it too, you might look at animals who form very close social bonds. They prefer one another, they travel with one another, they defend food and territory together. They miss one another when they're separated, they seek one another out when they're apart, they raise young together, blah, 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 blah. And the fact is that we can define love and that we don't need to use quotation points, a quotation mark. Some people will go, well, animals quote love one another or animals quote are happy. And I have no idea what those quotes mean. In some ways I might say that people quote love one another. We don't do very well in that arena at all. But really the most serious point, once again, is that people are collecting, quote, objective data, and then we're calling it something. Some people say, well, maybe we need a new vocabulary for non-human animals. And I think that that would be so counterproductive because that would support the notion of, that would be an argument from evolutionary discontinuity, which would defy everything we know about evolution. So just some slides. I mean. This is a pair of foxes. They were together for five years. They actually courted during the fall, uh, during the early winter. They raised young together. They looked for one another when they were apart. They were happy when they were together. You know, they listened to iTunes and Netflix together. I mean, I don't know. They were really, they were inseparable. So do they love one another? Well, yeah, I mean, I would have to say they love one another. I'm sure if somebody went in and did an MRI on them or looked at some of their circulating hormones or something, they would find the love hormones, like oxytocin or something like that. But I mean, seriously, um, is this a happy dog? Well, I think that you could say the dog was happy. I mean, I don't know this specific situation, but I don't think a human launched him into a pool. And then what about this dog? Is this dog jealous or envious? And you're gonna hear about this from other speakers, but I'm just showing you this slide that you know, there's been this research done in the field called inequity aversion that shows that animals don't like being treated unfairly. And the reason that this struck me was, once again, some of these phenomena are difficult to parse out in the lab. But in the years I've spent watching coyotes and wolves in the wild, I mean, they don't like being treated unfairly. They work very hard to cooperate in certain endeavors. And when an animal feels that he or she is being treated unfairly, they try to do something about it. And then there's been this research done on dogs by Frida Ricca Ranga and others, and lovely work done by Sarah Brosnan on capuchin monkeys that basically show this. And once again, I mean, the simplistic argument would be is if we don't like be in being treated unfairly, neither would they. But then when you look at it in terms of their social behavior, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, the integrity of a pack of wolves or the integrity of a pack of coyotes really depends on each individual making a contribution. And they monitor one another. You know, you may not know this, but most wild animals, like among the carnivores, for example, those 90 to 95 percent of their day, they're, quote, doing nothing in the sense they're lying down. That's because when they have to do something, they have to do it well. So they rest a lot. And if you look at movies or films of coyotes in a group or wolves in a group or any other animal, they're looking at one, of the, uh, one another constantly and they're picking up certain cues about other individuals. They see what they get and they see what they're doing. So another area that I think suffers from the lack of maybe, um, it's hard to access doing um, experiments is the question, do animals have a theory of mind? Do they know what other animals are feeling? Well, I think of course they do, but it's been really hard to demonstrate in the lab because we use these very non-ecologically relevant examples of humans hiding food and doing something and then animals watching them. Now I'm not saying those experiments are useless, 
But from the fact that it's hard to get supportive data, I think it's really dangerous to say that animals don't f have, for example, a theory of mind. When you watch a group of coyotes get up to do something or a group of wolves get up to do something, it would be like you and your best friends. You know what a particular individual is likely to do in a certain situation, and you change your behavior accordingly. Um, and so I just mentioned that because I think to me, one of the most exciting areas of research in the future is going to be getting back into the field and watching animals and s accepting the fact that observational data have a lot of significance, that there may be certain things that are experimentally intractable. We just may not be able to do a good job, but we shouldn't then deny that animals don't have certain capacities because we can't come up with keen enough experiments in the lab. So is that a happy animal? <laughs> I think so. Um, so another question that I've been toying with, and in fact, I just had an email from somebody in Germany yesterday, is do animals have a sense of awe or wonder or mystery? Jane Goodall has described these waterfall dances that it's usually male chimpanzees perform. And once again, looking at Continuity, if we have spiritual experiences, why couldn't animals have spiritual ex um, experiences of their own sort? Okay, so I like to say that human joy may not be the same as dog joy, and dog joy may not be the same as chimpanzee or elephant or mouse joy, but it doesn't mean that one group has it and the other doesn't. They're just different. My joy is probably different from the joy of a lot of you in the room, and my grief may be different, but it doesn't mean I have it and you don't, or vice versa. So this is really an interesting question, and there's a lot of people really interested in these questions. There's this great field called neurotheology that I find really exciting. That's, that's a baboon in the Amboseli who just didn't like me. Like everyone else in the group, I mean, we were maybe 10 meters from it, but when I stepped close, he would expose his canines, and I was told not to go closer, as if I, <laughs> you know, as if I needed to be told not to go closer. <laughs> and then when I'd step back, p people would approach him, and it wasn't like he went up and go, you know, good baboon, but, um, but the fact is, very discriminating, I and I have no idea why. Um, in terms of the PDS, PTSD research, I just wanted to mention the work of a woman named Hope Ferdowsian. Um, she's an MD, but she's done a lot of work. You know that recently it's been decided that finally chimpanzees, not all of them, are going to be removed from research and put into sanctuaries. You know, it's a long overdue process. But Hope has done some really neat work looking at different differential diagnoses of animals non-human animals and human animals, and you really can't tell the difference. You wouldn't know if you're reading the differential diagnosis of a chimpanzee or a dog or a cat or a, an elephant, for example, or a human being. This is Flint, a chimpanzee who Jane Goodall studied. And Flint was a happy-go-lucky eight-and-a-half-year-old chimpanzee, and when his mother Flo died, Flint stopped playing, stopped eating, stopped traveling with the group, and died about two weeks later, close to where Flo died. And then, of course, we have the examples of what elephants are doing. I've seen this in person in northern Kenya, and it's palpable. It, I mean, it, it, I can't even put in words how palpable it is to see a group of elephants that are grieving or mourning. And here's... Um, one where a little baby elephant was dying and the elephants come in, they touch it, they sniff it, they have very sensitive um, noses, if you will, you know, sense of, um, sense of odor, a sense of um, smell. And then, of course, a very famous example of a gorilla at the Hamburg Zoo. I, I don't think this is rocket science. I don't think she's a, a happy camper. I'm going to skip some slides here. Um, yeah, I mean, this is a very touching. This is actually still in process, in progress in Bangladesh. Um, so a monkey and a dog. The dog, I think, was there first. 
they became friends, and they hug one another, and when they're separate, they scream for one another. I mean, do they have a strong bond? Could we call it love? Yeah, but do they have a really strong and enduring bond? Yes, they do. And then, of course, these bonds go across species. Um, somebody gave me the slide, and I told them I'd use it, but, you know, I mean, it's like just cross-species relationships. I mean, I think for me, as a scientist, what's really powerful is the fact that these feelings of compassion and empathy do cross species, and a lot of it would be, you know, I guess if you're a mechanist or a reductionist, you could say about shared neurology. But once again, I think it drives home the view that animals just want to feel safe and comfortable and live in peace and safely, safety just like we do. So back to the example of PTSD, for example. Um, this is a two-year-old female elephant at the David Sheldrick Elephant Rehab Center right outside of Nairobi, Kenya. And so this is a female. She heard, she saw, and she smelled her family being slaughtered. And she went into deep depression. And what they do there is they take these elephants and they'll raise them till they're about 10 some can be released into Savo National Park in southern Kenya, some can't. And I actually, this is an elephant who I met, and one way they calm them down is you just stand there and you put your hand in their mouth and you can feel the entire weight of the body just rest, like this elephant is in total heaven and feeling safe. And so, once again, here's just a great instance of do these animals suffer severe psychological disorders after they see and hear and smell their families being slaughtered? Well, sure they do. So I don't, you know, once again, I mean, 10 years ago if I said that, people would probably be just incredulous. Now I think most people would agree. Um, so I need to, how do I, can I I'm just going to sail through some slides, okay? You're going to see this talk tomorrow, but um, I went to Germany and um, a couple of weeks ago, and Prescott wanted my um, PowerPoint, and I'm technical, technologically compromised. So just keep looking. You'll see these slides tomorrow. <laughs> I know. You got to get up. <laughs> okay. So just for the last part of my talk, <coughs> I know this is from... Uh, this is from the 2004 election from the Salt Lake City Airport. Um, I'll, I'll say no more. Um, I actually really do like it. Um, so, so here's what I want to know. And I think it's just really important to have very strong practical applications. Um, being here is really nice. I really thank Prescott. But for those of you don't, who don't know, um, Michael Fox, who you heard this morning, was my PhD mentor. And when I first met Michael, it was really, um, I don't know, in, in a sense it was, it was like a homecoming. Because I had been in an MD-PhD program and refused to kill cats for these stupid laboratories that we had to do. I mean, they were just stupid. And I remember, to be honest with you, I left that program the minute I got a deferment from the draft because that's the only reason I went into the program. Do you remember Michael? And I called Michael. This was before email and faxing and texting and all those f face plant or Facebook stuff. <laughs> and, um, and so I called Michael. No, really, this was a revelation because I regrettably did, um, I killed four cats in, um, for my PhD thesis in this MD PhD program. And I had this interaction with a cat named Speedo, who really just looked at me and, and me basically said, what the hell are you doing? I mean, really, it was like, and that was it. I just quit. And I didn't know what I was going to do. And I had been to Washington University as an undergraduate in St. Louis, not up here. And <clears throat> just out of the blue, the day that I decided, because I got my draft deferment, that I could leave this godforsaken program and not be drafted, I got the Washington University alumni news and there was Michael Fox on the cover. He had come the year after I left. So things happen in life that are confluences. I don't believe there's any coincidences in life. So I called Michael and I explained to him and I thought, uh-oh, you know, I don't know what this guy's gonna say. And it was wonderful, he invited me, I came and then I became his graduate student and he was 
the best mentor one could have. And one of the things I learned back then and slowly over the years, it's been growing, is why do animal feelings matter? What are we going to do with what we know? My students always have to have a practical application to their work. I mean, I've had students do theoretical work on play and dominance and reproductive behavior and lots of different behaviors. But in the end, I want them to apply it on behalf of the animals and not to the animal's detriment, to the animal's benefit. OK, so what are we going to do with what we know? And what are some of the problems we have? Well, one is that I call with a regeneration. We restore, recreate, reconnect, reestablish. Re just, we're reading everything, OK? And we're getting to the point where we have to stop putting out the fires, because eventually we're going to be creating situations that are just irreversible. Well, I mean, we're already there in many other um, situations. One major problem is that animals are property across the board. Now, in terms of dogs at least, it seems like there are more and more cases that are being considered in courts and people are being punished for doing some horrific things. But in a sense, your backpack or your bicycle has as many rights under the law as do non-human animals. So the property status is important. How we refer to animals, you know, so, you know, these are happy pigs. That's Geraldine on the right. Sometimes people just get confused. Um. <laughs> oh, wait. And this, oh, wait. I'm slow on this stuff. Okay, yeah. And this is sort of the confused view we have. And I'm not, doing, I'm not presenting this to be an ass. I'm really presenting it because I think we just really need to come to terms with the words we use to refer to other animals. We just really need consistency. And of course, that's bacon, pork, and sausage. And you know all about birds. I'm going to flip through these in battery cages. So I do a lot of work in China, and these are cats going to market. And these are dogs who have been rescued from their way to market. And people say to me, well, you know, how can you work in China? That's where they eat cats and dogs. And I go, well, I just came from America where they eat cows and pigs. Well, once again, I'm not trying to say that just to be a fill in the blank, but what, I mean, you know, why don't we eat all the surplus dogs in the world? 75% of all the dogs in the world are on their own and in pretty crappy condition. So maybe we can help food shortage by eating stray dogs. The important point, once again, across mammals and other animals too, but is that we all share the same neural structures. And I don't find it any more repulsive to think about eating a dog or a cat than a cow or a pig, but people do. And I think they need to say why. And I think the reasons that they give have to be really deep reasons. We use animals in all different ways. Um, animals is a, you know, um, coming to um, assisted living centers. <clears throat> this is in China. This is a woman who spent most of the week just kind of autistic, almost in her own world. And this was when she met the dog on Sundays. And this was in a cancer unit in a hospital outside of Chengdu. And I just saw on the Channel 9 news that it was just this big flashy story that now in America, dogs are allowed into hospitals. And they had a very heartwarming story about a dog helping a little boy as if it was new. And they've been doing this in China for years. And so somebody said, this just really pissed me off. They said, well, of course they did it there because they don't care about hygiene. <laughs> I just, I mean, but you talk about speciesism or culturalism. They've been doing this forever. So this is kind of my take home. Um, I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes at the end about the work in China. But this is basically, I think, a very important message. This land is my land, and I'm a sentient being, and I don't like what you're doing. And there's this whole field growing called compassionate conservation. It stresses first do no harm, animals are no property, are not property, we don't own them. And I'm not going to say much more. I just actually published a book, I think they have some copies here, called Ignoring Nature, 
no more the case for compassionate conservation. And this to me is a very, ra it's a very rapidly growing field. We've already had four international meetings. And what I love about it is that question of what do we do with what we know? We're wrapping what we know about animal sentience and cognition and emotions and all that into how we treat animals in the wild. And factoring compassion in, factoring in the importance of individual lives, and arguing too that compassion could be a two-sided coin. It might be the most compassionate thing to do to let some species go. We, we, and, you know, rather than distributing our resources, giving $10 to 10 projects, giving $100 to one. I'm, just, I'm not saying I stand for that. I worked on the Yellowstone wolf reintroduction. A lot of wolves died for the good of their species. That's a very important ethical question. Is it OK to trade off the lives of animals for their own or other species? So I'm just throwing that out to you, because I think this is going to be the wave of the future. So finally, I'll end off with some of the work I do in China, because it makes a lot of um, points, um, drives home a lot of points I've made. This is Jill Robinson. She founded Animals Asia. And for her work in, on Animals Asia and, and helping animals, she's a member of the British Empire. Um, she's an amazing woman. And her first program, in fact, before she started rescuing bears, was called Dr. Dog. It still exists. And that was bringing dogs into assisted learning centers, assisted um, living centers, and having dogs be catalysts for people and young children in need. So this is Haley. Haley's a veterinarian. She stands about 5'6". This is a cage in which this bear, Franzi, lived. The bear bile industry is really, really prolific in China. Bears are kept in the most horrific conditions with catheters in their gallbladders to produce bile. I'm showing you this because it's a message of hope, but I think sometimes it's important to see the downside. So this is Jasper. Jasper was kept in a cage for 15 years. There's his catheter. All he could move was his head and neck. I just had a kid's book come out. I wrote with Jill Robinson. I brought one copy, and it's out there. About, it's called Jasper's Story because it's a story of hope. This is the real world. We just rescued a bear who was in a cage for 30 years. Not 30 days, 30 years. This is me feeding um, Franzi. Franzi died two years ago, and she had a best friend named Rupert. Rupert was brain damaged and blind from being tortured in the bear bile industry. Rupert died a few months later, right after Franzi did. They were the only two bears. They could only be together with one another. The minute Franzi died, his behavior just changed. There were no signs that he was degrading physically until he basically died. This is me feeding Jasper. And this is the hope. This is Jasper now. I know he has great ears. No, he does. He's like dish, dish network for TV. Um, but when you look at him, remember, he spent 15 years unable to move anything but his head and neck with a rusty catheter in his gallbladder. So these are stories of hope. This is Jasper's girlfriend. She just got a pedicure, and they're, they're going out for dinner. No, this is actually a female bear who had also been tortured for 15 or 20 years. So what do we do? One of the things I do is I do a lot of work with Jane Goodall, and um, we did this nice book. It's online for free. It's 80 pages. And if you want to circulate something, put it online for free. I'm serious. And drawings from the hands and the hearts of children and youth. Um, it's been adopted in Hong Kong. It's in, in many countries because it's free, and we're not trying to make money off it. And we had kids draw things like, um, what is your dream? I have a dream that for every animal there was a person in which loves and takes care of it. I'm proud to be an animal lover. I mean, this is where the future for animals is, believe me, getting to kids. This was really a kid named Darwin. I, kept thinking, no, this just can't be true. Um, I have a dream that all the animals are safe from people. And I love this one. This is, I'm thankful for cats and horses. And the little girl who did it had to label cat and horse. Um, really, if you want to have an up, work with kids and animals. Um, what can we do with what we knew? In Boulder, they were going to kill prairie dogs on the campuses of the elementary schools because supposedly the prairie dogs were digging holes into which kids could fall. There had never been a case. 
So we protested, and they wouldn't listen to us. So what did we do? We got the little kids to do it. And guess what? They didn't kill the prairie dogs. And I worked with these four teenage girls in Medellin, Colombia, and Julianne here, and her friends got two members of the city council of Medellin, Colombia elected who were pro-animal. And this is a group of kids at the Bear Sanctuary outside of Chengdu, China. There's Jill basically saying to them, hey, don't buy bear products. Talk to your sisters and your brothers and your teachers and stuff, because kids, they'll let kids be and stuff, so it works. And then a couple of months ago, I met a most amazing woman. I've become quite good friends with her, named Lelini Munta. She's a NASCAR driver, and we call her an uncommon messenger. And her slogan is, never esti underestimate a vegetarian hippie chick with a race car. <laughs> but I'll tell you what's amazing about her is she is raising money now to basically make a vegetable vegan race car that's going to run on vegetable oil. She stands about this tall, and she drives NASCARs at about 200 miles an hour. I know, that's what I said. It's scary. But what I like about this is we need to also look for these uncommon messengers out there. I mean, what is she doing? Like, in, you know, people say, what are you doing? You're in this masculine world of NASCAR. Well, yeah, I mean, you talk about a macho world. But she's slowly but surely having an effect. So what does it all mean? And all I'm going to say is that I think we are terribly confused about our interactions with other animals and that we've severely underestimated their cognitive, emotional capacities. Sometimes we've overestimated them, to be fair, but we've severely underestimated them, and it's resulted in a lot of harm. And so just the first paragraph up here, I try to think of a global moral imperative. And it would be do no intentional harm, respect all life, treat all individuals with respect and dignity, and tread lightly when stepping into their lives. And just some little bumper stickers. We can't continue redecorating nature for our benefit to their detriment. There really is no safe, no place like a safe and a peaceful home that animals care about what's happening to them. They're just not blank, unfeeling beings. I love the quote from Nelson Mandela that we must exceed our own expectations. And to me, the bottom line is if the animals had a manifesto, it would be treat us better or let us alone, and that we just can't ignore what's happening to the other animals. And so I'm a hardcore optimist despite all the bad things that are happening out there, if you will. And so I'll end off with this picture of Jasper. This is Jasper on a hammock. We got money and we built these animals hammocks. And he loves to just hang out on the hammock. And once again, you can see he's got a beautiful coat. It's a real coat. He didn't go buy a fur coat. And he's as content as ever. And when you start to think about what he experienced, to me, is how in the world do these animals ever recover? So thank you for listening to me.